up. Okay, I can maybe talk louder because I'm actually not going to speak that much. I just want to very quickly introduce this panel. Um, we have five fantastic physicians from various um, specialties within medicine who are going to first introduce themselves and give a little bit of background on how they use clinical or how they use ancestral and evolutionary thinking in their clinical practice. Um, I might sneak in with a question and then if anybody else has questions that they would like to ask our physicians about how they use ancestral thinking in practice, we would love to take questions. Um, just please bear in mind that nobody's here to diagnose you today, um, so please no specific questions about your own medical problems. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much free game, and this should be a lot of fun. So hopefully you really enjoy it. I guess I'll start because I have the mic. Can everybody hear? Yeah. Okay. So, so my name is Don Wilson. I am an obstetrician gynecologist in a practice currently in transition from British Columbia in Canada over to Alberta. I actually did my training in Alberta, um, and I'm going back to the same um, the same city where I did my training. Uh, I do general obstetrics and gynecology. I don't have a subspecialty area, so I see a lot of pregnancy, uh, a lot of uh, gynecologic issues, uh, all the way from some pediatric cases all the way into postmenopausal uh, uh, gynecology, uh, as well as uh, high risk obstetrics and normal risk, just normal low risk uh, obstetrics. So for myself, I came into the interest area of ancestral health through my own personal background of being a, an Aboriginal person from Canada. I have uh, um, ancestry among the Hiltzik Hel people, or Hiltzik people, in the west coast of British Columbia. Um, as with many Aboriginal people here in the United States, there is a tremendous problem with um, obesity and uh, diabetes that's happened since um, dietary changes and lifestyles have changed, and that's impacted a lot of my own personal family circle. I learned about uh, low-carb eating at an Indigenous Women's Health Conference, and then in my investigations of all of that, learned more about the, the paleo approach. Uh, I use it in my personal practice because I do see a lot of women affected with problems directly related to, um, to their lifestyles um, and the mismatch, such as uh, diabetes and obesity, gestational diabetes, uh, chronic pain, chronic pelvic pain, uh, things like that. So I, I do educate my patients as well as I can in my, my short-term interactions with them about some of the uh, ancestral health principles about uh, altering their diets to, to improve their, their metabolism and uh, things like sleep and stress management and things like that. And sometimes there's direct implications for outcomes in pregnancy because um, women who are gestational diabetic, for example, if they're poorly controlled, they have worse outcomes. So I've had some really good successes with uh, using these principles with my practice. So I'll pass this on. We have quite a few people to get through. Um, my name is Anastasia. I'm a hospital medical resident from Australia. Um, I think my story is more about not being able to apply ancestral principles rather than to be able to apply them. So if anybody knows the life of a medical resident, um, you would know that we have to go through 30 to 40 medical patients a day that are on our ward. And I think um, as much as I have the motivation to apply these principles, as much as I try to implement them, the time is a major factor. So as you can imagine, I cannot spend, I cannot afford to spend 10 minutes with each patient with uh, such a patient load. Um, I think the other uh, side to the story is the fact that in an acute hospital setting, you have people who are, uh, are, are truly coming in with acute problems and um, they're not uh, as willing to listen. Um, they're not bad people for not wanting to listen, they just have other issues in their head right in their place at that moment. You know, when somebody's having a heart attack, you're not going to sit down and tell them about ancestral keys and <coughs> cholesterol stories and probably would not be interested in it quite as much. So, and, and it's, a, it's more of a long-term problem. Um, but I think we do talk a lot about uh, implementing this uh, in a medical practice, but I think a lot of people need to be aware that there's a huge uh, amount, a huge number of doctors who work in a, an acute care setting like myself. And uh, for example, in the Australian system, we don't get out of training until about eight to 10 years after university. So, um, so that's an additional eight to 10 years of very, very minimal interaction with patients. Um, 
with literally having 30 seconds of my time. Um, very frequently, what I do say may get over, overridden really quickly by um, other people. Um, for example, we had a, a seven-year-old girl who presented with the uh, diabetic ketoacidosis as her first presentation of type 1 diabetes. Um, she came back to us for a pediatric um, ICU uh, with the goal to optimise her insulin management and with the diabetes education. Um, believe it or not, as a doctor, I do not provide diabetic education. I'm not qualified to do that. Um, there is a diabetic educator who does that. So um, after having a very short interaction with a very sort of shell-shocked mother who just had a daughter nearly in a coma, to try to explain what the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes is, is really, really challenging. So when you come back to these people again and again and you go, you know what, your blood sugar this morning after breakfast was 30 millimoles, which is an equivalent of 540. So you say, well, maybe the Coca Pops, do you, do you have those guys? Yeah. 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 Cool. Maybe they weren't a great idea and you had cocoa pops for breakfast and then white bread with jam and orange juice. That was a diabetic breakfast provided by the hospital. Oh yeah, margarine, sorry. No butter because it's got saturated fat. Um, so to sit down with these people on a daily basis is a lot of, a lot of work. So what I would probably like to say is that relying on doctors all the time as herald of this message might be not a very good idea. <laughs> so we have limited time, and it's probably going to be very controversial here. So uh, just trying to say that maybe people really need to take their health into their own hands. Relying on a doctor to tell you what to do may not be the best way to go, because very often we have very limited um, opportunities to do that. Okay. Thanks. My name is Jacob Egbert. I am a physiatrist. Who knows what that is? Wow. <laughs> Quite a few. So, for those of you who don't, it's a physical medicine and rehabilitation. So we do a lot that deals with musculoskeletal complaints, back pain, other non operative <coughs> orthopedic issues, as well as the rehab component, which is usually in an inpatient setting where people who have had strokes with dramatic sequelae such as like half their body paralyzed or spinal cord injuries or traumatic brain injuries. We manage the team that rehabilitates these patients back to a functional Can you speak up? Ability. Thank you. I'll try. Thank you. Hey, there we go. So as a rehab physician, my goal is to increase the function of the patient. So they come in not being able to do X, Y, or Z. Get dressed, they can't walk, they can't communicate. My job is to coordinate a care team to facilitate the increase of their functional ability, get them back into their community and back to productive life. So that's one aspect. The other aspect being the orthopedic complaints, low back pain predominantly. And that's what I did in my previous practice. So how I implement these paleo or evolutionary type principles has been a little bit of a challenge, but it seems quite appropriate to the setting that I practice in. Because I see patients that come to me with low back pain that is a result of a very sedentary lifestyle with a high inflammatory component to their dietary intake, which results in a perfect storm for pain. And so I've attempted to teach these patients proper nutrition, proper exercise, Okay, apologies, this is Charlie here. Unfortunately, my battery completely died at this point and I had to switch back to my battery that was merely mostly dead. So we'll pick up again now. She, she understood the implications of poorly controlled gestational diabetes. Um, we talk, I talked to her extensively about uh, uh, reducing her carbohydrate proportion in her meals. And she started seeing uh, dramatic improvements in her blood sugars. And then she was heading towards having to start insulin in the pregnancy and then was able to back off from that. 
and then went to the diabetes education clinic and was told, you're not eating enough carbohydrates. Your brain's not gonna work properly if you don't eat carbohydrates. So she started eating more carbohydrates and her sugars again dramatically deteriorated. And she had a record of this because part of the management is keeping track of the blood sugars. And so she had a written record of what happened when she reduced her carbohydrates and then when she increased them. It's not magic, it's actually going back to basic principles, which I, I, I think one of the main issues that we all face in medicine in particular is we're so poorly trained in the nutritional sciences that we have a hard time translating that into our clinical practice. So we have to do all of our learning while we're in practice, at least that's been my experience. And um, unfortunately, many of the dietetics um, uh, professionals that I've had to deal with have also learned the party line about what to eat. The Canada's Food Guide, where I live and work, recommends five to 10 servings of carbohydrate-based foods every single day. I, don't, I can't imagine that's good for anybody, let alone someone with a carbohydrate metabolism problem. So these are just, that's one example of how I implement uh, the principles and have had some really good success. John, I, I'm a pediatric dentist in, in Chicago, and uh, you said something very interesting in that you said you're transitioning to a lower socioeconomic community uh, for urgent care, and you want to implement uh, evolutionary medicine principles. Um, I can do that very easily in private practice. I've eliminated tooth decay in my urban practice, but in the lower socioeconomic areas of Chicago, all we can do is drill and fill and drill and fill. And I would really love to know how I might implement something where I can do some diet, and I'm trained in dietetics and nutrition. Um, I would like to know how you might recommend that I can get away from drilling and filling and actually start to implement some of these uh, you know, paleo principles in the lower socioeconomic areas where they don't have access to healthy food and they just, you know, how are you gonna do this? Well, I, I, I think, you know, my approach, I think so one thing I've learned from, actually, this, uh, I think it was, maybe paleo effects, um, Emily talked about change um, last year. And we have to meet people where they are. And with every population, um, that's going to be different. Every patient population is going to be different about where they are now. Um, I worked on um, Indian reservations uh, for years. I was on Hopi reservation and the Navajo reservation. Didn't have any inkling of any of this stuff back then. That was back in the 20th century. Um, so, but but I knew that to try to get people to be healthier. I had to take what they were doing now, the kind of foods they were eating, the kind of activities and lifestyles that they had, and work with that and not against that. And I think that's that's one place we have to start, is meet people where they are now and work with what they already do. And if that's a food-based uh, thing for you, uh, dental hygiene-based thing for you. But are they going to give you time to do that in your clinical day, in your patient's encounters? How in the world are you going to make time instead of just putting out fires like you know tooth decay? How can I do fire prevention? You know, I, I, I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. That's not me. Well, are there parents in the room while you're drilling? Well, they're there. They're in, in not parents. You know, there might right. be one parent or one caregiver. That's a common misconception that they're nuclear and they're not. But they do. Somebody gets the kid to the visit. And that's an opportunity yeah. to where we can get somebody out there to do this, and nobody's trained it. You know? Well, I know in in my case, the less the less the patient has. So if it's a Medicare Medicaid patient, so or an impoverished patient, the less I get paid to see them. So the less worthwhile it is to spend more time. And that's the incentive in, in modern medicine, unfortunately. Um, however, you can bring people in to see them more frequently, um, and then I'm always very very nosy again about exactly okay what sorts of resources do you have in your neighborhood how much does this cost and i might i even have talks with people about you know what you know you're going how many times are you going to mcdonald's a month you know, have you ever roasted a whole chicken i'll write down a recipe for roasting a chicken 
and you know say look or you know hey buy these they're not the best quality oils but you know this this grocery store you know this grocery store has two chickens for five dollars on this day and just talk try to get more whole foods i mean it's very very at a basic practical level how i interact my frustration is they want my drill skill when i'm there not my nutrition skill and they won't give me time to go out there and talk to the parents so i'm just wondering you know i'm looking for advice it's very frustrating so I think largely um, part of this was that, that many of us can agree that there are ways that we can use our, our skills and our knowledge, but there are also limitations within the system. And unfortunately, we don't have the answers to all of them. And uh, you have to work within the system that we have. So I know I saw another hand. Sorry, I hate to cut you off. I also have more questions. So. I saw another hand. that you could do is that you could hold um, just like a, a short like workshop or seminar and ask patients to come in or maybe you have a, a certain topic area that you want to I mean I don't know how receptive they would be but that would be one way to um, you know to try to get the message out to more patients I might just um, add to that um, I think one of the ways uh, sometimes we, we get really focused on helping patients and the people who are in the problem but ultimately it's like you said it's you and the patient and the system that's not allowing you to to pass that problem along and sometimes you just feel really really alone so um, what I've been doing in a hospital setting with a, um, a limited success was um, actually doing education for other doctors so actually getting more people on board makes it so much easier for you. So doing like a, um, um, in a hospital setting, a, a medical officer uh, education session, just for, you know, within the sort of a, a, a training modality on sleep and the importance of sleep. You know, talking about, um, uh, you know, very basics of diet and maybe touching on cholesterol a little bit. Maybe talking about sugar, which seems to be the least sort of controversial topic, and actually getting more people on board that way. And I think we need to remember that the doctors around us, uh, or health professionals that are working next to you, they're also people, they're also the influence, they see the same TV shows, they see the same advertisement, and they are going to be patients one day. So you might actually be addressing somebody's patient problem even though they're medical professionals. There's some other hand out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my best advice for all of you is to think about uh, classes for the public. Uh, work with your libraries uh, to host classes and begin teaching the public. Uh, that's uh, been my take. It takes a, lo a little bit longer, but you'll have a much deeper uh, public health impact for your community. And I think your community may uh, be quite receptive if you begin having uh, classes at the library. Just you know, some observations. Um, <clears throat> I found it very um, frustrating dealing with colleagues. Um, I'm actually an eye surgeon. Um, I find it ironic that I probably spend more time talking about nutrition with my patients than their primary care. No offense. Uh, actually, they do, I actually did one year of family practice before my ophthalmology residency. But, um, you know, it's alarming. Um, we work with the geriatric population. And just Monday, just, just for fun, because I knew I was coming to this meeting, I did an informal study of my patients, I saw 60 patients on Monday, and 80% were either overweight or be obese or morbidly obese. You know, we're probably the only country in the world where old people are fat, uh, although others are catching up with this. So um, I'm finding it easier to discuss with patients who are now starting to educate their physicians and physicians who were very uh, dismissive about paleo. I'm finding out really indirectly because they won't they won't come to me face to face now, but that they're doing it too. 
then they're getting out their statins and the Viagra and all this stuff, you know, that the physicians are on themselves. So, so it's, uh, you know, it seems like we, we may think that patients aren't receptive to this, but I, but I would uh, submit that it's for colleagues where we're having trouble, you know, convincing them. Just also as an observation, I found it's, um, people are much more receptive to change their pet diet, <laughs> such as their dogs or their cats. So if you can give a paleo talk about pet care, um, you're going to have, personally, I have at least 20 times more pet owners that come to my classes than parents or people. So just one way, but if then they change their pet diets, they see them get healthier, and then maybe they'll make that connection. Pets are powerful. I've used that via analogy. Yeah. Okay. Would you ever give your dog a bowl of Diet Coke? <laughs> that just seems so absurd, doesn't it? Or a loaf of bread, something like that. But just some of the things that you would feed yourself, you wouldn't feed your dog. And when you give them that analogy, the wheels start clicking in their head and they say, wow, maybe this nutrition thing is something to think about. And so these little analogies, what I use in my clinical practice, that really, you've got to hit them and really make it click quick. And we don't have time in physicians to, to educate for a prolonged period. So those are just little tricks that we have to implement. I just wanted to, just a little bit of a, a I think it is important to sort of use your power and use your authority, but use it wisely. Not like a totalitarian dictator, but really as an example. Um, because people really do listen to their physicians and they really do respect what you, um, at least that's what they tell me. They <laughs> respect what you think about them and things like that. And um, I think it's important to use that influence as widely as possible. In fact, it's imperative. I'm wondering if um, any of you have tried to apply what's been used in the tobacco literature. I used to work with physicians and training that pediatricians in training them to work with parents to quit smoking uh, when they're putting their children at risk, which of course they are. Um, there are several pretty good protocols from uh, the tobacco literature in training physicians on how to intervene. I'm wondering if any of you have been able to apply any of that to your practice. <laughs> Are you talking about things like Pro Pro uh, Prochaska's uh, readiness for change and that type uh, of thing? To some extent, but a lot of that's been debunked. I'm talking mostly about the um, 4A, the advice, uh, the ask, advise, assist. So the ones where you're sort of assessing readiness for change and then just in, uh, implementing your... your to, to some extent. But that, that's kind of what I've done is just, is just minor um, <laughs> assessments of, of the patient's readiness to address some of these things. And it, it, there's no point in uh, barking up the wrong tree. If a patient is completely resistant to, to any of these concepts, I don't bother. I do the prenatal checkup and say, see you in four weeks or two weeks or whatever it's going to be. But um, if they're open to it and they actually seem to want to do something, then, then I will. But I haven't used the formal literature. I think that's a great point. You bring up a good point. Is if the patient isn't interested, mm -hmm. they won't do it. Engagement is so important on the patient's case. And so I was recently, I was reading something about a, I don't remember what it was, but it was some iconic health and fitness group. He says, I would never tell anybody about my diet until they asked me three times to learn. I mean, seriously, think about it that way. You trying to convince somebody, you can talk to a thousand people and maybe convince ten. But if you put it on your menu as something that you offer, right, like off the menu, basically, if they know that you do nutritional advising, if they know that you do these things, the ones that are interested will ask you about it and will come to you. And so we can't go and save everybody. We just can't. They come to us because they're in pain and they have a problem with it. We can patch the holes in the post, but we can't give them direction unless they ask. Have, have any of you here in the audience heard of Dr. Jay Wartman? He's a Canadian um, community medicine physician, also family physician, and he did a documentary on the west coast of British Columbia called My Big Fat Diet. 
and it had to do with returning to an ancestral diet in a First Nation community on the West Coast and had some tremendously beneficial impacts on their um, um, health parameters. So this was almost entirely a nutritional intervention, but there were other benefits as well. But he quotes uh, um, someone, and I can never, can't, I want to give the quote attribution properly, but he quotes this person who says, I'd rather try to change a, man, change a man's religion than his diet. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, you're, you're touching on some pretty emotional things when you're talking to people about changing their diet. And I, when I learned that from Jay, it, it increased my sensitivity when I talk to my patients about their diet. When I have a morbidly obese patient sitting in front of me at 29 weeks of gestation who has just come in with confirmation that she is a gestational diabetic, she doesn't need me to jump on her about what she eats. She needs a very gentle, respectful, careful approach, otherwise I've lost her. So it's only by being careful and respectful that I might be able to have any hope of having a, a, an engagement that can lead to some, some trust, which can then lead to her maybe implementing one or two of the 20 recommendations that I have. So. So I'm a family doc, um, probably a little, little earlier in evolution, I'm trying to figure this all out than, than what I'm hearing here. I really appreciate your observations. I'm also sort of um, fascinated by the, you know, my secret paleo life and the, the degree to which I feel comfortable experimenting or trying things out for myself and the things that I would actually feel confident explaining to a patient. So I'm curious if anyone is willing to reveal any of that uh, gap between what we do publicly as we push a bit of an envelope and what we're experimenting with personally. For me, I really notice it about supplements. The way I'm experimenting with supplements or understanding my use of them is certainly more um, adventuresome than I would ever suggest to a patient. And I'm just curious to know how other people are, are finding that, uh, that gap or, or whatever it is might be for you. Yeah, I, I don't think we should be experimenting on patients, um, <laughs> on our patients. Um, it's very different in, in, in N equals one where you have responsibility. So I'm actually fairly conservative and I really try to go for big shot, you know, sleep interventions, um, sort of whole foods diet interventions, those kinds of things that are gonna be very low risk. Some people, you know, I might mention specifically, you know, are book of B12 or, or magnesium, but I, I don't go off, you know, into wild and woolly supplements too often. So I agree there is a bit of a gap and I think the gap also has to do with the uh, you know the, the public knowledge and how much you can say because when people come to you and if they do actually end up asking a question what to eat which is let's face it not that frequent um, when they do ask a question the last thing you want to say is something along the lines of oh you should never ever eat grains because Monsanto is there to you know take over the world so you, it's really hard not to come out uh, to out there, to hippie, to extreme, and I think we always need to sort of uh, tread very carefully. So I, I go to say, you know, I go for a very low hanging fruit like sugar, and I start with uh, soda. Uh, so and and that's the easiest thing to say and. Um, uh, you know, just hearing it from a doctor can sometimes make a difference. Just say that, you know, you probably shouldn't be drinking two <laughs> liters you want, um, a, a day. Um, and then you maybe I'll go for something along the lines of, oh, let's, let's introduce more fruits and vegetables and, uh, you know, talk about some healthy fats. The things that I leave for last, the gaps, are going to be the um, saturated fat. Uh, I try to talk about healthy fat rather than go, woohoo, saturated fat is fantastic. Uh, because that requires a different level of engagement with the patient. Um, and the things that I probably would leave for last are things like dairy and grains. Uh, I, not that I'm going to say anything about grains, I'm probably not going to mention it straight off. If the patient looks like they're ready to take the next step, I go, hmm, let's, maybe let's talk about gluten. Um, but yeah, like just like you mentioned, it, there's a very big gap between what I do 
and how I eat and what my lunch is and uh, what I necessarily say to the patient in the first two sentences. So, um, um, I think we can all thank our physicians for being involved on the panel. I think, I think it's great, it, it seems really obvious that a lot of people in this room that are practitioners work with patients, work with people on, on facing health, wellness, um, and obviously a lot of people have expertise in different areas, implementing health, uh, education for patients in different areas in different communities, and it's great to see the communication that's going on and that's been brought up in this panel, and I think that can carry on throughout this this uh, conference, that would be great, and um, I look forward to having come to you. Thank you.